Hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining our WatchGuard and Myercom webinar, Five Simple Ways to Secure Your Wi-Fi. My name is Christine Ramsell, Marketing Specialist here at WatchGuard. I'm also joined by two presenters. I have here Ryan Orsi, Director of Product Management for Wi-Fi, and our special guest, Robert Smither, CEO of Myercom. So without further ado, I'm going to give it off to Ryan to start things off. Ryan? Thank you, Christine, and welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, just a quick introduction on myself. I'm, uh, I'm Ryan Orsi, uh, Director of uh, Product Management, and I look after the Wi-Fi product line. Uh, I joined WatchGuard in 2015, uh, coming from a background in um, antenna engineering, wireless, and RF chipsets. It was a really fun startup that I came from, um, and prior to that, also was in the uh, managed services business, uh, actually looking after a lot of different customers' networks. So uh, happy to be at WatchGuard and happy to be uh, here with all of you. Uh, how about uh, over to you, Rob, for a little intro. Yes, uh, thanks, Ryan. Rob Smithers, Myercom. Uh, 30 years uh, testing uh, and security practices. Uh, we test for vendors and customers. Pleasure to be here today um, and happy to share some of our test results with our audience. Thank you. Excellent. All right. So to kick things off, everybody, uh, we can kind of set the stage for our, our topic today, right? It's about five simple ways to secure uh, your Wi-Fi. And I think it's important, first off, to understand um, that there is quite a bit of a problem. You know, the, the Wi-Fi security protocol, and I'm talking about like the layer two protocol, is very badly broken, but there is no putting this genie back into the bottle. I mean, we have right now today about 13 billion active Wi-Fi devices ranging from Know, corporate enterprise devices, uh, things in, in you know, uh, machine automation, warehousing, down to consumer electronics. And actually 80% of smartphone traffic, uh, this is kind of an, an alarming statistic to many people, can actually flows over Wi-Fi. So um, this is a combination of just the popularity of people looking for Wi-Fi hotspots on their, their mobile phones, but also it's a combination of an emerging trend here. Uh, it's been around for a while, but it's cellular offload to Wi-Fi. So even though you're, you're walking around with your, your cell phone and it has the cellular you know, 4G or soon to be 5G uh, it, you know, icon on the top, um, there are certain access points that are configured around you to automatically transition your connection from a cell tower over to a Wi-Fi access point to save that cell tower, um, the, the, the bandwidth and the network um, you know, efficiency that you need. Now there's a, a whole new era of, of this uh, technology coming with Wi-Fi 6 and on the Wi-Fi side and with 5G on the mobile cellular side. It's actually a pretty interesting statistic that 59% of 4G traffic is offloaded to Wi-Fi right now. So again, more than half of the worldwide traffic of 4G is offloaded. And by 2022, uh, when we see 5G rolling out, uh, our, our friends at Cisco and the BNI report that they publish, very, very thorough report, are predicting that number to increase. So more traffic from cell phones that are 5G connected actually being offloaded to Wi-Fi access points. So the security topics that Rob and I are discussing today with you uh, has a very you know, big impact on you know, your, your smartphones and how you interact with them, even on a cellular perspective. So in, in summary, uh, when I said that Wi-Fi security is very badly broken, I'm specifically speaking to layer two in the OSI model, and there are exactly around six uh, Wi-Fi threat categories that have been allowed to run wild uh, for over 20 years. And it's quite interesting. You can see online the, the, uh, the, the online forums and YouTube that people really enjoy exploiting these vulnerabilities uh, at layer two Wi-Fi, and that's what we're here to, to discuss and to, to bring forward with you all. Um, it is important uh, to, to make notes here. If you're thinking Wi-Fi security, you might be thinking of the terminology uh, WIPS or WIPS. It's short for Wireless Intrusion Prevention System. And that's one of uh, Rob and his team's speciality of actually testing uh, WIPS functionality from different vendors. Um, unfortunately, there is no uh, standard in the industry that says exactly what features different access point vendors have to incorporate to their product to be able to claim they offer WIPs. So as the slide shows us here, not all WIPs from each vendor are equal. So very important for companies like Myercom to be here as independent third-party test labs uh, to really figure out what the capabilities truly are. So I'm going to save that part for, for Rob to discuss with you all. 
and just quickly introduce uh, the six known Wi-Fi threat categories. These are essentially the threats uh, along with a few others that, that Rob and team tested, and I'll let him go into deeper detail, but just to quickly highlight what they are. Uh, threat number one is a rogue access point, probably the most commonly used terminology in the Wi-Fi industry, but also very commonly misunderstood. A rogue access point is a Wi-Fi radio that's actually physically cabled into your network. And that's a very bad thing because it lets people connect to your corporate network uh, from like in a long extension cord over the air. An evil twin access point, those are not actually connected to your network, but they're typically broadcasting the same exact SSID. And it's also what the, how the attacks for Crack and, and Dragonblood, which were the attacks on WPA2 encryption and WPA3 encryption respectively, that's actually how they began with an evil twin attack. The neighbor AP is threat number three, and this is merely employees within an office connecting to neighboring Wi-Fi hotspots or their mobile cell phone hotspots, and it's, it's, a, it's a bad security threat for corporations because it allows them to bypass all the network security controls. Threat four is a rogue client, and that's where if a victim, potentially, you know, if myself gets, gets victimized by uh, someone having my phone connect to an evil twin, I might have malware on my device. That is a rogue client, and it should be prevented from connecting back into your corporate Wi-Fi until your security or IT team has made sure it's clean. And an ad hoc network is pretty simple. I think most of us have used it, but it's when a, say, a laptop and a laptop share a file over Wi-Fi directly, and that can, again, bypass network security controls, making it a security risk. And threat number six is a misconfiguration uh, misconfigured AP, and that means, very common example, somebody forgets to encrypt an SSID and ships the access point out with completely wide open. Uh, that should be quarantined, obviously, because that's a very bad security risk. So to kind of um, bring in just a, a one little level of detail on one of the, uh, the very bad threats, uh, the evil twin, not, not the good twin, but the evil twin attack is attack number two. And this is a typical whiteboard drawing that I like to give to people. And it's sort of, you know, one of your takeaways you can, you can take with you to explain to your colleagues and friends around your, your, your respective businesses how a Wi-Fi hack typically works. And for example, in the evil twin case, we have a laptop on the left connected to maybe uh, the guest Wi-Fi at a bank. So they're sitting in the bank enjoying the guest Wi-Fi. That access point that's broadcasting banks Wi-Fi it's connected to a switch, and then it's connected through a router or a firewall and out to the web. And that person browsing the internet is checking their email, maybe logging into their CRM for customer management, maybe buying things online. And everything that person is doing on that Wi-Fi session can actually be silently stolen using just YouTube and a few tools online. And typically, what will happen here in the evil twin scenario is this. They, the attacker can bring in another access point, typically battery powered, and broadcast the exact same SSID, again called Banks Wi-Fi. Now that's the evil twin, threat number two. Uh, the good twin would be the one being broadcast from legitimate access point. But that evil twin access point, now uh, the attacker has full access to everything that user is doing, and the user has no idea. So. Uh, in case you were wondering all, that actually is uh, Martin Lethbridge from WatchGuard at outside Barclays Bank in the UK uh, doing a lightweight version of what Rob's going to talk about and um, determining that Barclays uh, you know, Wi-Fi was actually susceptible to this kind of an attack. And what the real bad people do is they serve internet over a mobile uh, cell connection. So they no longer let the user go through the corporate network. They actually pull them off the corporate network and give them internet access through a cellular connection. So that's just an example, kind of an illustration of how it goes out there in, in the wild. And I think now would be a good time to hand the microphone over to Rob to talk, to, talk us through the latest Minercom WIPS validation report. Uh, thanks, Ryan, and uh, what, what a great intro. And uh, I guess we should put a disclaimer. We do not recommend sitting outside banks and hosting a Wi-Fi hotspot. I, I just think I can see the black van pulling up. So um, please uh, don't, don't attempt that at home. But uh, no, really just how simple 
it is to conduct a lot of these exploits. You don't have to be a security expert. Really, all you have to know is how to access YouTube and somebody can be very creative and uh, you know and, and access a lot of information on the network. So um, I want to thank everybody again for your uh, time today. Uh, Myrcom, we've conducted testing for many, many years, 30 years. 30 years has been a long time. Learned a few things out there. Uh, happy to show you what we found in our testing here. Uh, and um, I welcome your comments and your feedback. I mean, we really, we're only as good as we are because of the customers, the audience, folks that have given us feedback, the vendors as well. So we learned a few things from uh, your feedback and working with these vendors, and we uh, welcome that feedback, uh, even for this presentation. So how, how we conducted the review? A, a lot of these tools, as Ryan pointed out, they're actually open source. Uh, I mean, we had to make you know minimal investment, Hacker 5, to get the pineapple, a little specialty tool uh, to do the um evil twin wi-fi i mean there, but it's not hard to get it's not overly expensive and a lot of open source products available um wireshark wise by insider there's a uh, very easy to access products very low cost if you go the license route live action is a product that, that i like it's basically wireshark on steroids and it's got a good wi-fi decode capability so tools of the trade makes it easier to do what, what you do uh, to see these things, not difficult at all. The breadth of products that we looked at in this evaluation from WatchGuard, Aruba, Cisco, Ruckus, and Ubiquity can be seen here. I'm going to talk a little bit about the test and what WatchGuard did versus the competition. And, uh, and again, the, the briefing goes along the same uh, line that uh, Ryan shows. We, we agree to the six use cases, these six threat conditions, which are not overly complicated and they're, and they're still exploited every day um, that users need to be aware and you need to protect yourself from. Um, our testing was both these products as complete systems, Wi-Fi providing security, and then we did a second measure of the testing where we said, okay, well, let's just say I have this incumbent vendor's Wi-Fi APs. I can just put WatchGuard in, in, in an overlay mode to provide that WIPS security function. So this isn't necessarily like a forklift upgrade to provide Wi-Fi security. Like, well, we just already upgraded all of our APs and we don't want to switch the vendor right now. Okay, well, you don't have to. Uh, with the WIPS protection and overlay mode, WatchGuard will play well with others and provide you that security overwatch on top of these other APs, which I'm, I'm sure uh, you're going to see are, are woefully short in their security. Um, Ryan brought out the rogue access point. Uh, rogue access point, somebody actually plugs, plugs in an AP into your network. And, and I can think two reasons for doing that, right? One, just for ease of access. It's a good employee, but look, it's just a pain to get through our credentials for login and all this stuff. So I brought my own AP in and I want to have users, uh, myself, my, I want to have other people access it. But that's outside the control now of the corporate environment. So in one case, access point was brought in for making it easier to access the network, connected to the network. And uh, guess what? I've really removed a lot of that user level access controls. I've, I've kind of taken that away from the administrator. Administrators don't like that. So the first case is ease of use, plus an AP on the network. I don't want people to do that. Second case, they do it possibly maliciously. They find a little hidden place in the wiring closet. I'm going to plug the AP in there, and uh, I'm going to lure people to use it. And, and I have control of that rogue access point as a malicious AP, and I can eavesdrop. I can do things on that traffic. So whether it be for a matter of convenience, somebody does it, and it defeats the security, or someone maliciously puts an AP on your network, one, you want to know that it's happening, and two, you want to prevent it. You want to stop it. Now, WatchGuard was the only product that could stop the action of putting that rogue AP on there. Obviously, you can't stop them from physically plugging the AP on there, but I can, func I can stop it from working. I can stop clients from connecting to that rogue AP. So with WatchGuard, I had both the visibility to know I had a rogue AP on the network, and secondly, I could actually stop users from connecting that. And third, I get alerts and warnings to tell me that it's going on. So I got visibility, I got action to stop it, and I had follow-up notification and alerts to, hey, this is going on in your network, you might want to look at it. So rogue access point, 
I see that advertised in, in four out of five of the vendors tested, but it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work uh, for some reason or doesn't work well. And certainly the prevention does not work because the prevention, um, WatchGuard has a very unique way to implement the prevention, which is legal, which is a legal prevent. Uh, it, it doesn't violate any rules of FCC and so forth, but I can knock users off because I've got good inventory of who's on my network, good authorization of, of who is and who, who isn't. So I, I'm on very firm grounds when WatchGuard makes a decision to bounce somebody to network. So Rogue Ac Access Point, kudos to WatchGuard uh, for the only vendor to pass both detection and prevention. The evil twin, this is interesting that Ryan spoke about. So, okay, evil twin, here's my little hacker dude sitting there and he's advertising the SSID uh, pretending to be Starbucks or pretending to be your corporate. He's parked in your parking lot. Oh, it looks like my network. And you connect to him, and then he passes it through uh, to give you access. He's eavesdropping that whole time. So the evil twin uses that SSID, um, likely uses likely uses a, a spoofed MAC as well, uh, MAC address for that AP and his process, to fool you into connecting with him. So this is definitely a deliberate attempt to do something uh, maliciously, surreptitiously. You you want to know. So again, I detect it with WatchGuard. I can stop it. I can stop the users from connecting to that evil twin access point. And of course, I know what happened. I was given a notification and alert so I can investigate what's going on here. So this is a very serious but commonly used approach for stealing information. Keep, you know, if a hacker can just see what you're doing from cradle to grave, from your logging on to logging out, whether you be checking your bank or just you know, reading your email, logging into your server uh, you know, from, from a remote device, they have, they have access to everything. So the evil access point test was a uh, evil twin access point test was very valuable. Um, to take it one step further, we looked at um, a access point with, with specifically Mac spoofing, where we didn't copy, copy the SSID. Ruckus says they can, I, I should really single out any one vendor, but other vendors say they can, they can stop this. And, and they might be able to detect it, but they can't stop it. And in the one vendor's case, the only competitor that said they could stop a spoof Mac address for an AP we could say, yeah, you, you could actually see it and detect it, but you can't stop it. Um, so one vendor came, uh, was able to detect out of, out of the five vendors. WatchGuard could, of course, but the, the other contenders, only one vendor could detect a spoofed Mac, but yet it still failed the evil twin test. So it's got some capability, but, but not enough, not enough. The neighbor access point. So, uh, you know, Again, I, I give people the benefit of the doubt. They're on our network and they're connected to, I'm on the guest network here where I'm authorized to be or I'm on this network. But, you know, it's restricting me from going out where I want. So, oh, wow, I can see there's another open AP that I can connect to. I'm going to connect to that neighbor network, but I'm supposed to be on this network here. But I'm going to connect to the neighbor network because I can't get to the things I want. So it's innocent. I'm, I'm doing that for... Um, well, it's just you're limiting me, and I want to go here. So, but my my admin, my sysadmin doesn't want me to do that. It's like, no, if you're in our company, you're doing stuff. We would rather you go through our Wi-Fi, go through our Ethernet. Please don't go through some guest network that we don't support. Don't bring your own Wi-Fi hotspot in, or don't hotspot with your phone. Maybe you figured out a way to umbilical to your laptop, or just you know be your own Wi-Fi hotspot. Um, perhaps. So you, you, you want to know when someone's connecting to a neighbor access point. Uh, you want to be notified and you want to stop that action. And WatchGuard was the only vendor that could detect and prevent connection to a, to a neighboring uh, access point that's unauthorized. Rogue client. Uh, as Ron mentioned, he said, well, what if somebody was connecting all over the place they weren't supposed to? And what if their device was compromised? What if it had some kind of mobile malware on it now? You don't know because where they've been. You can actually block that rogue client uh, from accessing the network. 
uh, because you know where it's been. Wait, I've seen you before. Wait, where have you been? I see you trying to connect or we're connected to uh, a rogue network, a rogue AP. I'm going to then block you, you know, pending some admins notification to, to clear you for access, just to check that everything's okay. And, hey, why did you do that? Or um, So it, it, it's a form of keeping everybody safe. I, I don't think it's a, a matter of inconveniencing uh, users or making them feel uh, belittled. This is, a, this is an important thing. You, you want to make sure um, someone that's gone out of your, your policy that's coming back to you is, is still compliant. Um, a, a second test that we did, uh, to up the ante on rogue client, we also tried to manipulate MAC address. So I took a, we took a rogue client and we actually mimicked a real, this is, so this is for malicious purposes, we are mimicking a real client. I'm using the MAC address of, I copied the MAC address, spoofed the MAC address of a real client, right? And tried to connect to the network. WatchGuard was the only one that could detect the MAC level spoof at the client and supported that. So. A little bit tied to there, a little varying of the rogue client, but WatchGuard was the only one that could detect uh, the, the spoofed rogue client as well. Ah, ad hoc network. Again, benefit of the doubt. Uh, it's just so hard to go through the corporate Wi-Fi to go all this and get you the stuff. Look, just here, I'm going to beam it to you. Put, your, put our laptops back to back. Let's just do our little ad hoc Wi-Fi between them. Convenient. I get it. We want to be able to share, share massive amounts of information before, uh, between devices. But corporate policy might not allow that. It's like, look, no, if you're going to be sending, you know, our manifest, our sales database, if you're going to be sending all this good sensitive stuff, we prefer you to go over our corporate network, you know, where I have uh, data loss prevention products, I have firewalls and things, and I'll let you guys connect that way. Because when I allow people to connect out ad hocly, um, we have no control over what information is flowing, let alone what other things might be flowing those users might not be aware. Maybe one of the users in the ad hoc environment had some kind of malware on their computer, and now you've just allowed a path for that malware to come over and bridge to the person that's offering the ad hoc, net, ad hoc network. So again, I give people the benefit of the doubt. Probably did it out of convenience, but you've now opened the door to uh, other breaches and malware and so forth, and you certainly circumvented um, the controls, which we would like to see in place for companies uh, employing the ad hoc network. And uh, lastly, the misconfigured AP. It was just a mistake. We forgot to enable password. Now nothing's encrypted. We shipped that AP out to the branch office. They just put it up there, the small office, and a mistake was made. So we need some kind of management inventory tracking to know, oh, wait, this is not in compliant with our policy. This is our standard config. This does not fit in. Uh, very good. Aruba does a little bit about this, but WatchGuard, you know, to the nines. To the nines. So we saw some evidence of some management uh, de de detectability of out of configuration. So misconfiguration, whether it be, and I give it benefit out, human error, we just made a mistake, we didn't make that setting, or we didn't put the correct config image on there, or could be done maliciously, someone intentionally, um, maybe not outside your company, maybe somewhere in a supply chain, maybe they did something to that AP so that when it gets to its destination for deployment, it wasn't really ready for deploy, deploying and it was somehow uh, tampered with. So misconfigured access point is going to tell me if something was tampered, um, if it's not configured in, in the uh, policies that I like. And, and again, I, I think human error accounts for a lot of breaches. I think last uh, IDC research I saw, as much as two-thirds of, of, of breaches and access could have been avoided if there wasn't some human element of a mistake or, or judgment made. Um, so this is huge. If we can stop the mistakes uh, accidentally or on purposely, that's fabulous. Uh, we presented uh, Wirecom Certified Secure at RSA San Francisco uh, just last month. Uh, the only vendor that can, can could conduct uh, and detect, prevent all six Wi-Fi threat categories uh, very cost-effective solution, far superior security, quite frankly, than I've seen anybody have on the market. I'm just, I'm just haven't seen it. Want to see it? I want to have it a tighter race. I want to have more aggressive, uh, a tighter comparison. I'm always challenging vendors, but this really blew the doors off of uh, the other vendors' Wi-Fi security that we've seen. Uh, we're presenting the Myricom Certified Secure Award 
for achieving 90% or better in all categories. Well, you, you kind of took the race and got 100% in all the categories. However, a 90% is the requirement for certified secure. Congratulations to WatchGuard. And this table summarizes our results, where, where we're going to talk about, the, briefly, I'll show you the, how the product tested by itself. Uh, could it detect? And the P is the prevent. And pass fail. Um, you might see an MP. MP means, well, to prevent, we had to do some manual prevention. So it's like, if you need to do, prevent that from happening, assuming you knew what happened, you could go into the AP and manually take some action to stop it. Um, but we, our, our, our uh, standard for pass and prevention is it needs to be automatic. Someone might not be sitting there watching that at the time. So MP is manual prevention. And what you want to see is passes across the border. Pass across the border. Now, so the first two columns are Aruba by itself, right? And we're testing this. Column to the right is with Aruba with the watch guard just doing an overlay. So I, don't, I didn't have to rip out my Aruba. Uh, I, was, I put watch guard in WIPS mode, and I used it specifically for the security. I didn't have to interfere anything in my network to do that overlay with watch guard. And I had complete 100% detection and prevention ability for all six categories. Oh, wait, I count a seventh row there, Rob. Yes, seventh. Oh, by the way, um, we ran them all together. We said, great, I, individually, but now let me really challenge you. Let me throw them all together and see if that can overwhelm you. Uh, so our seventh category is everything together. Throw the kitchen sink at it. Oh, by the way, we were also running a load test during this. We were running video streaming and so forth, and, and that took a great toll on the products under test, except WatchGuard. So uh, take your pick. Do you want the AP to be providing good Wi-Fi and streaming, or do you want to be providing WIPs? And with the WatchGuard solution, we were able to maintain video, concurrent video streams with the WIPs provided. Most of the other vendors could not. It was pick one or the other. We saw video compromise while we, while we enabled WIPs. And it's just the nature of the beast. We're really oversubscribing, overworking these APs by asking it to do WIPs and its AP function, but, but not with WatchGuard. So we, we did the same technique for Cisco, Ruckus, and Ubiquity. We tested them. The first two columns for Cisco, Meraki is just them, and then with the WatchGuard overlay to get perfect marks. Ruckus, same way, fell short. Ruckus overlay with WatchGuard did great. Ubiquity. So we ultimately proved it was very easy to put WatchGuard as an overlay. You know, because I said, well, it's going to be a tough sell to tell everybody, look, you just got to replace all your APs with everything WatchGuard. I know WatchGuard would love to hear that, but, you know, in some cases, it's just not possible. I'm very incumbent here. But you can provide excellent Wi-Fi security at a minimum by putting WatchGuard in uh, at, at, a, um, at, at an overlay mode to do the WIPs function. And then you can deploy WatchGuard newly in your new deployments in your other areas where you're doing the upgrades, and then you get both in the same box. So, I, I did notice a high level of interoperability between WatchGuard and these vendors' products. So, um, yeah, I was. This this is quite shocking when you look at the fails of of the other vendors. And it and if it says fail, that means they were supposed to do it. And we did contact their support. If it says NA, it's like I'm not going to kick them because. They never said they could do that function. So I'm not going to give someone a fail if they don't advertise doing it. Um, so if NA means they can't do it and they didn't claim to do it, fail means they couldn't do it and they claim to do it. So they get a fail. We did contact their different vendors, uh, tech support. I found this repeatable. This is the uh, second year that we looked at these different vendors' products, different models, of course, and there's definitely a trend. There was some improvement this year from uh, previous years testing uh, from, from the vendors. So, I mean, the key takeaway to this is I want all green for all six threats. I want things automatically prevented. Um, I'd like to see more vendors doing this, but for now, I don't. I mean, the only solution I see seriously for any enterprise deployment, you're either using WatchGuard or you have WatchGuard in overlay mode. Nobody is doing WIPs like WatchGuard is, period, hands down. Uh, I challenge anyone, if you have a product you think that does it, send it our way. I'll test it for free. Uh, we would love to see anyone else uh, because it's really, it's really amazing. And I have to give credit where credit's due, which is the good engineers that uh, designed the technology behind the uh, WatchGuard WIPs. 
The uh, report, um, we, we, are, we, we will offer the full report. This information we gave out in the webinar is pre-release information. It hasn't hit the streets yet. Um, we're putting out uh, some components of it, but this report should be available probably closer to the end of the month. Um, but uh, we're, you know, so we showed you, please, this, we, we gave you a lot of information on this briefing. Welcome for the feedback. Um, if you click on the link and the report's not there, there will be a link that we will send you the report as soon as it's published publicly. And with no further ado, I'll turn it back over to Ryan. I hope you're still awake. Uh, thank you for listening, Ryan. Oh yeah, oh yeah, still still here. Great great work, Rob and, and team. I mean, as, as you as you put it there, um, you know, hey, we, we do a lot of uh, a lot of presentations just in the thought leadership realm, and we also would like you know more vendors paying more attention to this as well because it just it just increases the security level of Wi-Fi um, as an attack surface in general. The, the more of us vendors that are, are taking this more seriously, but. Um, what, what I wanted to kind of do next is um, the reason why I'm wearing the, the good twin shirt is uh, we've been focusing heavily on the evil twin vulnerability, the, the threat number two there in the trusted wireless environment. And um, we've, we've kind of crafted a lightweight, not Myercom official, right? The, the full test is what Rob and his team does. But we've kind of crafted a lightweight field test that anybody could do if they were curious enough to do it that's safe and legal to determine if a, uh, if a Wi-Fi network is vulnerable uh, to just the evil twin attack. Um, and I wanted to kind of walk you, you all through that, sort of what, what we do at WatchGuard. Some of our reseller partners and even some of their customers have begun to kind of play around with this kind of an, uh, it's an assessment, really. You're assessing if somebody's Wi-Fi is vulnerable to evil twin, which kind of would clue you into, okay, Maybe we should be testing the full thing. Maybe we should call up Myercom. Maybe we should look at someone that does these tests and, and really you know, pull back the, the, the full thing here. So I'm actually going to try to give you guys a bit of a live demo now. And I'm going to share my screen. So maybe uh, here we go. Let me share that. And let me get things kind of situated here. Hopefully you all can see. I'll give it a moment. Maybe, Rob, you can give me either a thumbs up or a yes if you can see my pineapple screen and a, and a cell phone I'm screen on the I, right. I do. Perfect. Clear. Perfect. All right. So first up, just kind of show you guys inside the Orsi layer. <laughs> uh, got my, my copy here. I've got my, my Wi-Fi pineapple Tetra. Uh, this is, this is the, the, one of the tools that, that Rob uh, mentioned. Um, this is the Tetra. It does 2.4 and 5 gigahertz uh, penetration testing. Totally legal. It's just an access point. It's based off of a Linux kernel, and it's loaded with all sorts of goodies that help uh, you know, security specialists do pen testing on Wi-Fi networks. Um, usually, I have this thing plugged into a battery bank, but today, for simplicity, for screen sharing, I've got it plugged into my laptop. But usually... This little bad boy is hanging out in that backpack right there, or rucksack, depending on what part of the, the ocean you're from. And anyways, uh, so that, that's kind of my setup. It's my, my laptop, the pineapple battery operated sitting in, in, a, uh, in, in, a, in a backpack tucked away, and then the cell phone that you guys are looking at right now. And what we do, right, you get to a, a, a Wi-Fi environment, um, you pull up your pineapple, I'm logged into the pineapple's dashboard right now, and the first thing you do, which is, I'll, I'll spend more time on this in a second, to keep this safe and to keep this legal and to not interfere with anybody's Wi-Fi, you know, that's what you don't want to do is interfere with ongoing business activity. You need to go into your filters, which is a menu item here on the pineapple menu, and client filtering. This is just very basic MAC address filtering, and it, the client filters specifies what Wi-Fi devices are actually allowed to connect to the Wi-Fi pineapple. So I have one MAC address in there, and if I look, look at the right side of my screen here, my iPhone, general about, and I scroll down to Wi-Fi address here, you can see on my, my mouse, and you line up the MAC address numbers, that's what I've typed into my Wi-Fi pineapple. So the pineapple will ignore everything else in the environment except for my cell phone specifically. So it's never going to be interfering with uh, any you know, uh, ongoing business activity of, of somebody. And that's the, 
very important step never to forget. Otherwise, you are being kind of a, uh, a pain in the neck to, to a business. <laughs> you would be interfering with, with their Wi-Fi, and you do not want to be doing that. And th the next step is, um, you know, you go into, say, your phone, and you would connect your phone to Wi-Fi. And I'll just show you my, my home network here just for a second. The only thing you're going to make note of is the IP address scheme, right? So in, in my case, 10.5.1.x. That's kind of my IP address scheme for the legitimate Wi-Fi in my home office here. And in your case, if you're out there, you know, in, in an airport, coffee shop, a shopping center, a hotel, um, you'll, you'll note down, okay, the legitimate network is, is something, you know, 192.168, or in my case, 10.5. So after you've noted that down and you've connected to, to that legitimate Wi-Fi, you go into your Wi-Fi pineapple, and very simply, there's a menu item called networking. If I scroll down, make this nice and big, there's an open SSID setting. Looks like I forgot to pull that out. And um, I'll just make something up here, right? If I was at a, at a, uh, a Wi-Fi network that was named Hotspot, all I do is type in Hotspots and click Update Access Points. And after the green text goes away, the, the radios inside that Wi-Fi pineapple are, are rebooting and, and coming back to life. And if I click on my, my Wi-Fi on the right-hand side here, eventually I should see, oh, there it is, hotspots. If I connect to hotspots, um, the one thing that I'm going to be watching for to determine if this place has some kind of WIPs technology to protect me is I'll look at my IP address right, 172.16.42, and that, that happens to be the same IP address scheme that my uh, Wi-Fi pineapple is on. And literally, I just sit and wait 10 seconds, 30 seconds. You can give it a full minute if you want to be very, very fair. I, I forget what, 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 what Rob's uh, time window was. But if this IP address remains 172.16, then I remain connected to the evil twin. I remain connected to the pineapple and there's no protection in the environment. And that, that location would thumbs down, it would fail at least this one very kind of basic evil twin vulnerability assessment. What you will see if there is whips running in the environment and it is detecting that my phone is connecting to an evil twin access point, you will see this IP address automatically flip and change back to whatever the legitimate IP address schema was. If it was 10.5, it would actually flip back. And that is what's, what you're seeing as a user in front of the phone. You're seeing the legitimate APs in the airspace detecting an evil twin and a client device connected to it. And those APs would be sending out uh, the authentication frames to just like a bar bouncer, break us up. It would be breaking up the connection from my phone to the evil twin and my phone would automatically reconnect back to the, the good twin, the proper access point, and the IP address and the network would all be connected the, the, through the proper channels. So that's, you know, that's kind of your lightweight field test. It's safe, secure, you're not disrupting anybody. I call it the, the vulnerability assessment because that's sort of what you're doing. It's not a full complete test, it's just a lightweight uh, vulnerability test. So let me stop sharing the screen and transition you all back to slides for just a moment here. And uh, just wanted to keep that uh, public service announcement <laughs> nice and loud. Keep it safe. Keep it legal. You're only testing yourself. You're only pen testing yourself. And remember what, what I did, right, on Android, on iOS, the, the Wi-Fi MAC address of your device. It's located in different menu items, but note that down. And whatever Wi-Fi pineapple you happen to be inclined to purchase, there's different versions of them. Um, there's even the small, tiny guys. This is the Wi-Fi pineapple nano, right? A little more, little more pocket-friendly. Uh, whichever one you do buy, make sure you use client filtering, and you only allow those MAC addresses to connect. And um, that, is, that is safe and harmless. We've tested it around, all, all around the world. Uh, no issues out there. So some of the tools, you know, Rob gave you a, kind of the list of the, the full uh, assessment that his team does, but, but just for this kind of lightweight field test, um, I'd recommend the Tetra, the Pineapple Tetra, just because you want to be able to test 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. The 
smaller, more compact nano. It only does 2.4 gigahertz right now. That that might change possibly through some rumors I've heard from from Hack Five. Um, also, you want to buy this little tiny Raylink RT 5370. I've got one plugged in right on the back side of my Tetra. This allows the Tetra to have another Wi-Fi radio to connect to potentially your mobile hotspots or some other version of Wi-Fi so that uh, users that are connected to it also get internet service. Um, and a power, a, a battery bank. You need uh, some kind of battery bank. This one's recommended by Hack5. I, I also use it as well. Uh, 24 watts for, is required for that, that Tetra. If you don't supply it with 24 watts, you're gonna have the Tetra rebooting and causing you a, a bit of a headache. Screen recording software, you know, I, we, we, we do some, some videos from time to time, but even just for your own records, just screen recording software, so you, you talk through the fact you're using client, you know, client MAC address filtering, you have proof of it, that it was safe and secure, and uh, don't forget your, your coffee. That's also a pretty good tool. Keep, keep you ready for the day. Um, so yeah, we, we also have a, uh, a, a test guide here to let, let the folks know about. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's not on the level of what, what Rob's folks do, but it's kind of like a, a, a quick and dirty at trustedwirelessenvironment.com. You can see uh, sort of high level how, how we've uh, been able to do some of the field tests out there and just a basic uh, pass-fail definition. It's kind of the, the abbreviated version, so feel free to, to grab a copy of that as well as the full uh, Myrcom report that'll be available there as well on our watchguard.com website uh, for, the, for the full details. So uh, we'd also like to now uh, kind of bring us all back to uh, the, the five tips. We wanna make sure that you're getting education, you're getting knowledge, and you're also getting uh, five tips that uh, you could take back to your office with you, to your boss, to your teams, to help secure your Wi-Fi. And I think Rob and I are gonna split these tips up I believe, Rob, you've got the first one, all yours. Oh, goody. Wi-Fi best security practices. Let me click on it and see where it leads me. Ah, 15 character pre-shared keys. Yes, please. The most common the most common mistake is not using long enough passwords. Use those keys when you're supposed to be using them. Uh, continually patch the controllers. Wait, this is all over the place. Got a lot of lot of suggestions. More than one thing. So segment. So Wi-Fi best security practices with the um, pre-shared keys is, is one of the key things. WPA is better, but still vulnerable. Uh, turn on client isolation. These are all important uh, uh, things that you want to have on best practices in your network. And I think the second one was yours, Ryan. Yeah, if you have anything to add to that one here. Uh, no, I think I think you've got it there, Rob. It's just uh, uh, don't forget to patch uh, firmware. Uh, I can't tell you how many times our our you know we have a rapid response security team at WatchGuard, our our, our CTO, our, our SDP engineering are heavily involved. So many times we see um, new CVEs come out, and they've been you know patches from vendors are available very quickly. But the time for people to adopt patches for firmware uh, updates in their controllers, God forbid if you're using controllers, <laughs> or your, your access right. points, it's a bit of a delay. So people, please yeah. stay on top of your firmware updates. It's, 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 a, it's the first thing to look for. What's the, the attack surface? What, what are they using? If it's out of date, it gives the hacker a head start. So it's the first thing our white hats look for. You know, what, are the, uh, what are the versions of code running? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the, the second tip, right, so there's some, some best practices. The, the second tip, um, I think it's about knowledge, right? You are using Wi-Fi perhaps in your office right now, listening to, to Rob and I. Um, is your net, network vulnerable to these six threats? Is it vulnerable to five of them or two of them? Um, you should have knowledge of that, and your, your company deserves to, to understand, you know, what are you dealing with? Um, and is it something that you think you should be taking seriously? Obviously, Rob and I being in this, this industry, we feel you should take it definitely seriously, but knowledge is power, so understand if they're vulnerable. You can try that, uh, at least that evil twin test, and you can read about how to do that um, if you want to share it with other people at trustedwirelessenvironment.com, um, or hire Rob's company, right? Myercom will be able to do a full, full test for you guys and assess the entire network. Uh, we also have a, uh, you know, a, a very large worldwide uh, WatchGuard reseller channel 
We have uh, launched a new uh, specialization program in secure Wi-Fi. So you can look on our website and search if there's a, a WatchGuard reseller nearby your, your city, your location, uh, that might actually have some capabilities of doing this testing for you to come in and do, a, do an assessment. Uh, so you can find that at WatchGuard.com and just look for, look for companies that uh, you might be wanting to work with that have that secure Wi-Fi specialization checkbox. And that means that they've gone through some additional training on specifically uh, WIP security, and they can come in and advise you and kind of guide you through, through the process of understanding what are you up against and, and you know, guiding you through some, maybe some ways to, to actually close those security gaps. And Rob, back over to you. And, and obviously, check that the security features you have, are they actually enabled? Uh, a lot of the WIPs features are not enabled on products as they ship because they take extra resources. You might not want them on. And they aren't necessarily intuitive to enable as well. The interfaces and the terminology is different. What one vendor calls a rogue AP is, doesn't, isn't what another vendor considers a rogue. So the terminology also changes. So I, I encourage you to take a look at the documentation for each vendor to know what you're getting into. Uh, you know, does it even have full whips or at least what they consider whips? They all consider themselves having some manner of whips. And I'd say, yeah, they, they each have a little bit of something. Nowhere near the six things that we were that we assessed, but know what they have, know where to enable it. Um, it is not on by default uh, when, when the products are shipped. And you know, and just you know, quite frankly, even if it is turned on, a lot of them don't work. Uh, but at least give yourself a fighting chance and, and enable a feature before you complain that it doesn't work, I guess is the moral of the story. And, you know, as far as our certification on WatchGuard, when we looked at the product line, the total Wi-Fi and the secure Wi-Fi uh, solution from WatchGuard, it's the only vendor's product we've tested that meets all six of those categories. I, I think I would make that an RFP requirement before considering another vendor's Wi-Fi solution. Do you meet these six basic levels of Wi-Fi security? Um, I know we mentioned uh, five vendors in total today. If your vendor was not mentioned and you'd like to know how they shape up, just message us. I'll be happy to send you a separate report on how well they do or don't. We, we pick market leaders and those that we're running into commonly and those that are making noise that they have some WIPs capability. So we, you know, called them to task and held them accountable. Um, but there's a lot of other Wi-Fi vendors as well. So if you'd like to know how your vendor stacks up to the six known Wi-Fi threats, just message us. Be happy to uh, give you a, an individual uh, comparison. Uh, but we'll, so we'll make it easy. I'll, we'll tell you which ones do and don't stand the test. Right now, we found nobody that meets all six requirements but WatchGuard. So consider WatchGuard. Consider a vendor approved for these six threat categories is the recommendation. Ryan? Awesome. Thank you, Rob. And just to add a little color, um, well, li literally a little visual here to the concept that uh, when Rob's team tested um, WatchGuard access points as a WIPS overlay, I just wanted to kind of, uh, uh, kind of illustrate for the people on the call today that um, every WatchGuard access point can operate in two different modes. So the first mode is on the left-hand side of your screen right now. That's where uh, it, you're in deploying WatchGuard access points. They're cloud-managed. Um, printers, cameras, laptops, mobile phones, they're all connected from a Wi-Fi perspective. They're receiving you know, Wi-Fi service from those APs. And that blue circle is just to graphically show you that they're also being secured by the WIPS uh, signal. It's actually a broadcasted signal over the air and, and also onto the, the network side. And so in, in that particular case, that's sort of mode one. Uh, you get all the benefits of being trusted wireless environment compliance. You get troubleshooting in the cloud, captive portals, location analytics. The secondary mode uh, that Rob talked about is just purely using WatchGuard for WIPS. And graphically, what that kind of looks like from a deployment perspective, suppose you have four Ubiquiti Unify APs. Um, you're going to need about one WatchGuard AP for every three to four third-party AP. Because, again, that, in this case, that WatchGuard AP, it's, it's an AP125. It's configured uh, in the Wi-Fi cloud for both of its radios to be dedicated to WIP security. And it's configured to say, 
protects th- these SSIDs, which are broadcasted by those U- Unify access points. And that's sort of what it looks like. The printers, the laptops, the, the, the cameras, and the mobile phones, they connect from a Wi-Fi perspective to the existing Unify access points. Nothing changes there. They never, ever connect to the WatchGuard APs, but the WatchGuard access point is sitting there like a security sentry broadcasting that WIP security center, uh, signal to protect all of those Unify access points. And in, in that case, that's the, the WIPs overlay that, that we've been talking about, and that does make that whole network um, trusted wireless environment compliant. So just to get a little visual of the, the two different modes from a deployment perspective, that's sort of what you're, you're looking at. And uh, tip number five would be to consider hiring the pros. Uh, like I mentioned, you know, there, um, there are quite a few, and it's growing every day, uh, Wi-Fi or WatchGuard One uh, channel partners that have specialized in that extra technical training for uh, secure Wi-Fi. And so they've been trained specifically on WIPs and WIPs overlay and compliance around, you know, p- you know making sure your Wi-Fi is, is compliant with that security standard. Um, so those, those resellers also have access to uh, a free uh, Wi-Fi design service. So if you're working with a WatchGuard One channel partner, um, they can actually work with you uh, and leverage a, a team of specialists that are CWMP certified uh, to actually do your predictive surveys. So you work with the partner, they talk about the size of your buildings and where maybe existing APs are located, how many people have to access Wi-Fi, um, what kind of application and bandwidth requirements you have, and they'll work with their, their WatchGuard experts to deliver you uh, the best design showing you recommended access point models, predicted 2.4 and 5 gigahertz coverage and capacity, and even recommended installation locations for those APs. So together with your channel partner at WatchGuard, you can figure out how, what kind of a deployment are you looking at. And it's a full, it's a full project scope, uh, very, very good to be working with a secure Wi-Fi specialized uh, WatchGuard partner. So to kind of, uh, kind of wrap it up, you know, if, if you uh, were interested in, in getting your, your feet wet with the, the WatchGuard Wi-Fi solution, there's sort of two ways to get going. Uh, right now, you can absolutely go to watchguard.com forward slash eval. You'll get a free 30-day uh, evaluation access point. So you can play with uh, the security features, the cloud management features, um, troubleshooting, uh, remote monitoring kind of features, captive portals, location analytics. You can play with all that yourself uh, in your environment with a physical a- AP on a free 30-day eval. So highly recommend you go there to go get a, uh, an AP to play with. Also, um, you can play with the Wi-Fi cloud, so just the management console uh, right now. So you can go to watchguard.com slash Wi-Fi demo, and that'll allow you to actually, you know, you won't have a physical AP, but you can actually log in even right after this webinar. And you can play around with some of the menu items and get a feel for some of the things we talked about from security and also all the, uh, the, the, the Wi-Fi offerings that are inside that, that platform as well. Uh, one last thing before we open it up for, for some questions here at all. Um, there is this movement called the trustedwirelessenvironment.com. I would highly encourage you all to go to that website, sign the petition. And what that petition is all about is it's showing in numbers people that care about designing a new Wi-Fi security standard from a global perspective. So that would benefit every vendor that that Rob tested out there, uh, WatchGuard ourselves, um, all of you on on the call today, because we truly think also that one of the the biggest solutions to this problem uh, is it's so deeply rooted in the the protocols of Wi-Fi as a standard that we should probably be looking at as an industry for new security standards in the future. So if you can show your support, that would be amazing. All right, everyone. Thank you once again to Ryan and Robert for all that great information. Thank you, attendees, for joining us today. Uh, But we look forward to seeing you again next time. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Thanks, Rob. Thanks, Christine.